Welcome to A Canadian Investing in the U.S., a podcast and YouTube channel focused on Canadians buying real estate with host Glenn Sutherland. Welcome to another episode of A Canadian Investing in the U.S. This week, my guest is Dave Debo. If people don't know who Dave Debo is, Dave, give us an intro to yourself. Thanks, Glenn. Uh, Dave Debo is a marketer and a real estate entrepreneur. And uh, I've been in this real estate game one way or the other for quite a few years. Uh, really kind of got serious about it in 2003. Started off doing creative, no money, low money down type deals a la Ron Legrand. Did 18 deals in 18 months when I first got started. That's kind of my little initial claim to fame. Took a few years off as I helped a up and coming Canadian real estate guru grow his business and, and his speaking company. Uh, did that for about five or six years. In the meantime, took a little break from real estate, then got back into it in 2010-ish. Started focusing on client first or tenant first rent to own deals. Did a whole bunch of those. Wrote a book about that, did courses about that. That was, that was kind of cool. That's when I first started raising capital. And then since about 2013, I've been focusing on uh, multifamily properties. And I've kind of removed myself from the picture, Glenn, because I realized I'm a bit of a doofus when it comes to dealing with tenants and toilets. And I'd rather let smart guys and gals take care of that side of things. And, and I help out with some capital. I, I totally agree with that too. I, uh, first, first of all, I don't enjoy that part of the, the business. Um, but, and I know that there's people that can do a much better job than me. Uh, I know when I did my own screening, when I used to do all my own properties right here in my backyard, that, uh, I, I, I made some mistakes. <laughs> I made some mistakes. I, I probably should have picked some different people. Uh, but that's a whole nother thing. So you yeah. mentioned off the start, like you were doing 18 deals, 18 months, uh, no money down was, yeah. um, JV structure, raising capital structure. What were you doing at that point? Uh, I didn't have a clue about any of that stuff. I took one of these American gurus courses, Ron Legrand translated all that stuff into Canadianized it more, more or less. So yeah. finding desperate motivated sellers who are willing to do weird and wonky things with their properties. So I'd get in again with little or no money down. So getting somebody to sign over the title to their property for a buck, uh, taking over properties subject to the underlying, underlying financing, doing options, doing lease options, all these kind of creative things that didn't really require much cash, which everybody gets excited about, Glenn, but here's the challenge. Uh, and looking, looking back, 2020 hindsight, I was good. I'm glad I did yeah. all that stuff. Yeah. But I left, I mean, I, I did a lot of deals in a relatively short period of time, but I left a lot of really good deals on the table that I could have done if I had have had access to some money. And I didn't have any clue about that at that point. Took some time off and, you know, became the marketing guy for, for that guy that was up and coming with, with his uh, speaking yeah. business. Then got back into it. By that time, I had some capital, had some credit. And I, I self-financed my first few deals, like most of us do, yeah. and then ran out of cash. And that's when I started trying desperately and unsuccessfully to raise money. <laughs> the, old, the old school way, like, like, I don't know, have you ever heard this? Find a good deal and the money will find you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You hear it all the time, right? Well, I, yeah. I call BS to that because I found a great deal and I, I had it all, the numbers all crunched. I knew how much my investors were going to get. It was going to be a really good return for them. But obviously they didn't just magically fall into my lap. So I thought, okay, well, what do I do to start raising some money? So I'd heard, you know, if you need to raise money, pick up the phone and start dialing for what? Dollars. Exactly. Is there anything <laughs> worse than that? Oh my God. Well, at least not for me. I suck at dialing for dollars. I dialed and dialed and rejected and rejected and rejected. My old, poor little ego couldn't take that much. So I quit doing that after a very short period of time. Yeah. I also heard, hey, when you need money for a deal, turn every conversation into a real estate conversation. You oh, probably yeah. some version of that as well. I'm sure people love that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So I went out to the local Chamber of Commerce, local B&I, Postmasters, whoever had a group of people together and would let me in the door. I showed up with my business cards and my 
schlepping around and shaking hands and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> Zero capital for that. And then uh, I thought, okay, well, this deal will sell itself if just enough people see it. So I put together a little PDF and emailed it to a couple hundred people on my contact list. And that was the first thing that got any sign of life for me there, Glenn. And I started getting these emails coming back and I was excited. Then I started reading these things and basically they're saying, Dave, hey dude, I haven't heard from you in five years or in one case, 10 years and worst case, 15 years. Ooh. And here you are, you hit me up for cash for a deal. Take a hike, <laughs> buckaroo. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, basically, you can see the end of this ad story here. I didn't raise the money for that deal. I lost that deal, ticked off my tenant buyer, ticked off the seller, ticked off the realtor, ticked off the mortgage broker. Small town, that's where I live in. Got some serious mud on my face. And that's when I gave my head a shake and I said, Debo, what are you doing, you twit? If there's one thing you do re reasonably well, it's marketing. Why don't you figure out how to apply marketing to raising capital and finding JV partners and get people reaching out to you instead of you desperately and creepily chasing after them. So took a little bit of trial and effort, but I came up with what I call my five-step money partner formula. Since then, uh, raised millions of dollars from my own deals. Again, yeah. transitioning out of single family homes into multifamily properties and have helped uh, at this point, hundreds of other people cumulatively raise hundreds of millions of dollars for their deals uh, following this process. So I think yeah. it's a better way. Yeah. And I love, we were talking a little bit before we started this show and yeah. you mentioned uh, the JV. We, like, I was like, oh, JV versus raising capital. And you were saying they were very similar or very same sort of marketing techniques that go into both, right? Yeah. Well, well first of all, let, let me do a little time out. Before yeah, we get sorry. So what, <laughs> what is your definition of a JV just to make sure that I'm, I'm on oh. the same page? Well, my definition of a JV is, you know, you have a working partner and a money partner. Um, I know typically in Canada, it's the the money partner qualifies for a loan, not the case the way I do it in the States, but th that's kind of how the, the you know, very vague. <laughs> um, that's how I look at it, the JV. I, I do so realize- JV is the money partner, correct? Yeah, you're working you're working with someone where you're doing an equity split, is my, I think is more of the way I think of it, is an equity partner rather than uh, paying a percentage. Yeah, rather than a, a, a debt partner or something like yes, that. Yes, yes. Okay, so to me, it really is one and the same. It, it really doesn't matter. That's, that's, bottom line is you're getting capital, you're using somebody else's money to do the deal. Would you agree? Yep. If there's a JV or it's an equity partner or a debt partner, basically yep. the same thing. Whatever money isn't bank money is what I'm, I'm kind of calling investor money or money partners, right? Whether they come on with debt or that equity, doesn't really matter. The process for finding them, in my opinion, is the same. It, it really is. Okay. And, and again, I, just a quick caveat here, Glenn, because I know a lot of your, your folks are, are keen on doing deals in the States. That's what the whole gist of the Canadian investing of the USA is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got to cover my butt here. So quick caveat, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a security specialist. Before you go gung-ho with this kind of stuff, make sure you're set up properly. If you're working with Canadian investors, you're set up properly for that here and whatever the heck the, the ramifications are for doing that down in the States. I don't think they care too much if you're working with Canadian investors, but you got all those securities and exchange things and each state has its own regulatory body. Each province has its own regulatory body. So you got to make sure that you're, you're compliant because none of us want to go to jail. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but basically what, what I've come up with here, what I think I've come up with, Glenn, at least, you know, for me and, and for our clients, yeah. is the way to access the low hanging fruit, the way to get the capital, the fastest, uh, the easiest capital that, that I'm aware of, and just the most logical place to start. Because a, a big mistake I see a lot of people making when they first start raising money is they think, Anybody with a pulse and a checkbook that doesn't bounce is fair game. That that's what a lot of any you know I can get it. I I, I get where they're where people are coming from, but that's very uh, it's very dangerous from the securities point of view because again my understanding of these things is unless you're licensed to do so or unless you get an offering memorandum or unless you've got in the states exemptions or the proper proper corporate structure set up 
it's illegal for you and I, unlicensed, to raise capital from the general public, right? So we right. want to stay away from that. And then the other thing is just common sense. In order for somebody to invest 50, 75, 100 grand with us, they're going to need to know us, like us, and trust us, right? Yep. We're going out to strangers, we're going out to the general public, they don't know you, they don't like you, and they sure as hell don't trust you with their money. So you're starting from scratch, and that's, that's rolling a big rock, big heavy rock uphill. So let's, let's go after the more logical choice. Let's go after the low hanging fruit. And that is what I always suggest to people is start with people who are already within your sphere of influence, people that you have a pre-existing relationship with. And what I always recommend, Glenn, is that we try to come up with a list of about 150 to 200 people as our target group of prospective investors. Now, obviously not all of them are gonna be ready, willing, or able to invest with us, but we have a pre-existing relationship with everybody and that's where we're gonna get started. Does that make sense? Yes, that totally makes sense. Yeah, yeah, so that's the that's this first, I've got a whole five-step formula about all this stuff, but yeah. that's the first step. Let's, let's dial it in on 150 to 200 people and then let's avoid doing the stupid thing I did, which is spamming everybody with our deal just kind of rushing in like a bull in a china shop. Let's be a little classier about it. And let's let's reach out to people, reconnect with them on a personal level first before we start talking business. Because I tell you what, Glenn, um, if, if people walk away with anything from this interview, it's that. You know, don't rush in just because you need the capital right now, just desperately chasing after it that way. It's the wrong thing. Plus, when I did that, I shut myself in the foot because I turned off a lot of really good prospective investors. And it's so hard to turn that ship. You know, once you've, you've made that lousy first impression, very hard to go back and fix it. I don't want to cut you off because I, I, I love where this is going. But you hear these stories of people like they put themselves in terrible situations where they have to find this money in a short period of time and they go out and pull off this miracle of raising a large amount to save this deal. Um, does that like, is that enough? It seems almost like opposites, like to, because you, you're going to have to go spam a ton of people in order to do that. And is that just like shot in the dark luck or you just happen to find across the right people or well, how, well, how does that work? Let me, th let me ask you this. Do you hear more about the lottery winners or the lottery losers? More, well, I, I guess probably the winners. I guess depends who you That's hang out with. hear about are the lottery yeah. winners. Unless you never, you're talking to your friends who didn't win the lottery. <laughs> you never hear about the lottery losers, which is the vast, vast majority. Yeah. So again, I, you, know what, you know what I think the difference could be, Glenn, is those people that pull off those miracles aren't starting from scratch. I think they've already done some groundwork ahead of time. They're not just going into this right from scratch. You know what? That's true. That is very true. A lot of the people that we work with are what I call mom and pop real estate investors, right? These are the folks that are, they got two or three deals under their belt that they've self-financed, they've run out of cash credit. Now it's like, how do I grow from here? Yeah. Those are the people I'm, I'm talking about. If you're talking about big time syndicators and stuff like that, yeah, they can pull one out of the, out of the air like that every once in a while. But mom and pops are just getting started much more difficult. Plus, quite frankly, you know, most mom and pop real estate entrepreneurs are not salespeople. So they're not used to picking up the phone and dialing for dollars. They don't even know how to get started. They suck at it. Yeah. They aren't used to presenting their deals, doing investor presentations, pitch decks, any of that stuff. They're starting from scratch, right? So they don't even know how to get started with all of that. So um, the chances of them pulling a, a Hail Mary like that, very, very slim. Can it happen? Of course it can. But it I, can I always happen. But yeah, it's yeah, because you're just going to be spamming and running around town yelling at everybody. <laughs> yeah. So can, this is this is another big mind shift that I like to share with people, because we we hear that find a good deal and the money will find you. I say I call BS to that. However, here's the deal. So when it comes to the chicken and the egg, which should come first, the money or the deal? My philosophy is the money should always come first. Now. Caveat here. I'm not talking about getting somebody to sign me a check for hundred grand and it's sitting there in the bank ready to go. What I'm talking about, Glenn, is having a group of investors ready to go in the wings, people have, who have put up their hand and said, hey, Glenn, 
you know what, when you've got another deal, let me know. I want in, I want first dibs, right? So maybe they've signed off on an expression of interest, a letter of intent, something like that. Maybe you even have them uh, meet with your mortgage broker, get pre-qualified, something like that. But they haven't cut you a check yet. They right. just said, I'm ready to go. I want to take part in this when you've got a deal. So our goal is let's get a bunch of those people ready to go, investors in the wings, and then let's go find the deals. Let's go make the offers. Let's go get a little bit more aggressive about our negotiating. So basically the, the idea is let's get those investors lined up, ready to go in the wings yep. so that when we've got a deal, we've got the mojo, we've got the confidence, we can go out, we can negotiate, we can make offers, we can get a better deal because we know we've got the capital lined up to do it. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. I think where we're going with this next is where do we find these people? Where do we get this, this people to make our little list here? Okay, well, that's a good question, uh, Glenn. And a lot of people freak out when I say, hey, come up with a list of 150 or 200 people. You know what? It is hard. It's almost, it's impossible to think up on the spot 150, 200 people. You know, a well-connected guy like yourself, maybe, but most average human beings, no. So here's where we start. Start with your cell phone. Go to your contacts. Scroll down to the very bottom. You'll see how many you got on there. Chances are it's more than you think. Export all your contacts out of your phone. Get them into an Excel spreadsheet. Same thing with your email contacts. Don't worry about sifting and sorting and filtering yet. Just get them all out of there. Export them out of your email uh, system. Get them into that spreadsheet. Same with your social media contacts, your Facebook friends and your LinkedIn contacts, whatever. Don't worry about it yet. Just get them all out of there. Get them into one spot, that Excel spreadsheet. And then instead of having to come up with 150 or 200 people, now we're going to start with 1,000, 1,500, 2,000 people, whatever it is and whittle it down very quickly to about 150 to 200 people. And here's my criteria, Glenn, is as I'm going through the list, if I see a name, if I read a name and a face pops into my mind, and I have a generally positive feeling about that face, <laughs> keep them, all right? Okay. If I see a name and I have no clue who the hell that person is, delete them, because you don't have a pre-existing relationship. You don't have a good connection, no. No, so kind of the, the minimum criteria to think about if you bumped into this person on the street, could you, would you have a nice conversation with them? You bumped into them in, in the lineup at Timmy's, could you have a nice conversation? They'd know who you are, you know who they are. That's kind of the minimum criteria for keeping them. So then you whittle it down to 150, 200 people, and now you're ready to get started. Awesome. So you got all these people. Um, how do they know you're a real estate investor? How do you have any authority to that they think that you're credible and able to do real estate deals. You're just a hard driving kind of guy there, Glenn. I tell you that that's step number four of our five step process, but did I jump well, some? Okay. We can, we can, we'll step through this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go fast. Cause I know you like to keep these short and sweet. So here's, here's what we want to do first, Glenn. We want to not do what dumb, dumb Dave did. Okay. Which is spam everybody and kind of pound your chest and saying, I'm so great. Right? No, we don't want to do that yet. Here's what we want to do instead. With that list of 150 or 200 people, before you even start talking business, before you even start talking real estate or, or investing, let's reconnect with those people on a personal level first and then transition into talking about real estate. Okay? Yeah. So here's, here's what I learned from my dumb mistake and here's the process we do with our, with our clients. Yeah is we do a very simple three-step warm-up campaign or reconnection campaign. And the first couple of steps are all about just reaching out to people, like let's say sending an email to all 200 people on your list and saying, hey, you know, in your case, it's Glenn. Chances are it's been a while since we connected. I just thought I'd reach out and reconnect with you and let you know what I've been up to. Okay, so then we kind of do a brief little recap what you and the family have been up to for the last, let's say, three, four, five years. Yep. I know you've got a beautiful family and some little kids, so catch people up on if you got any new ones that have <laughs> arrived on the scene. Uh, you know, if what the names are, ages, a little bit. Don't get too carried away. I know this is more of a problem with grandparents than with parents, but you know what I mean. Yep. Remind people about the spouse, if you guys have moved, if you got a day job, what you're doing, you know, what, you know, trips that you've been on. 
nothing too recent probably, but no, <laughs> uh, fun stuff you guys have been doing, not so great stuff. So how COVID has been, you know, affecting you, but don't let, don't add, don't leave it on a, a downer. So talk yeah. about the good stuff, talk about the not so good stuff, but leave it on a high note. And then at the end, this is very important, Glenn. This is, these are the magic words. This is what I've been up to, but how, enough about me. What about you? How are you doing? Please hit reply to this email and let's catch up. I'd really love to reconnect with you. Pew. Send that off. Use an email autoresponder system, something like Get Response is the one we recommend or MailChimp or whatever it is. Something where you can have all 150 or 200 people in there. You create one email. It goes out to everybody all at one time. Okay. Because if I tell people, hey, send out 150 individual emails, they'll send out 10 and then they'll get tired of it and that'll be it. So use, use technology to your benefit. And then here's the real trick, Glenn. Yeah. Make sure that when people reply to you, you do have that genuine reconnection. So jump right on. Somebody replies to you, tells you what they're up to. Get back to them. Email them back. Go back and forth a little bit because there are literally thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars in those reconnections. Super, super important. Does that make sense? It does. And people do like to talk about themselves. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they love, I, I love to. <laughs> Everybody does. Why the hell do we host podcasts for credit? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So that that's really important. Then the, the last part of that puzzle is, is the transition message, right? Because we want to, that's all warm and fuzzy. It's reconnection. It's genuine. Like you, you want to have a genuine reconnection with people. But now we want to give them the heads up that we're going to start switching gears and talking business, talking real estate. So I do a transition message, something like this. Well, hey, it's Dave again. It's been really good reconnecting with you over the last week or so. Want to let you know that moving ahead, I plan on doing a much better job of staying in touch and letting you know what I'm up to with real estate investing. Real estate is something I'm really passionate about. I've been doing really well with it. In fact, I think real estate is the best way for everyday folks like you and, and me to get an above average return on our money backed by something solid, real property. And who knows, maybe sometime in the future, you might even want to partner with me on a deal and share in the profits. But you know what? If you're not into real estate, that's okay too. You can always uh, click on the unsubscribe button at the bottom of any of my emails and you'll be taken off my list immediately. And in the meantime, if you haven't had a chance to get back to me, let me know how you're doing. Please hit reply and let's catch up. Take care. And we send that off. So that is, that is a very effective segue from the warm and fuzzy to now we can start doing the marketing, right? Now we can start doing what I call the constant consistent communication to stay top of mind with our investors, plus to get them to reach out to us asking about our deals instead of us chasing after them all the time. That's what the real goal is there. Does that make sense, Glenn? That makes sense. And like I'm a MailChimp user. So do you set up several different lists or you have one main list and you kind of work off of that? You start with one main list and then you might create a segment depending on who replies, right? Okay. That'd be a really good subgroup or sub list to create. So you send out, you've got your 150 in there. You send out your warm up campaign, let's say 20, 25 of them reply and you have a little bit of go back, going back and forth. Well, I would create a subgroup of those people, you know, yep. hot prospects or something like that in there because yep. they've actually, they've actually responded to you. We talked about it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that, uh, that's still step one. <laughs> <laughs> so create the list and then reconnect with them on a personal level. Step number two, I'll go through these fast. Make sure you've got a really good investor presentation to show people because here's what happens, Ben. That warm up campaign isn't designed to get you meetings booked, but in about half the cases of the, of the clients we actually work with to make this happen, that happens. So in about half the time, somebody will get, a person reaching out to them saying, hey, Glenn, uh, I didn't know you were doing real estate. Well, tell me a little bit more about your deals. So now you got to be able to do what? Present. Tell them about your deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, shit. Now what? So that's that's what we do now. Next thing is make sure you've got a really effective, I suggest, slideshow presentation, a PowerPoint or a keynote, something you can take people through, high level, 30,000 foot perspective in about 20, 25, 30 minutes kind of thing, fairly short and sweet. Don't get in. Here's a big challenge I see. People, you and I and your listeners, your viewers, we are real estate enthusiasts. 
Yeah. Or real estate weirdos, as I affectionately call us, <laughs> right? Yeah. We're into this. I know you are, my friend, because I've oh. seen you at different events. You know, we love this stuff, right? Oh, yeah. I travel everywhere. <laughs> well, I used to. I used to. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. But we're sponges for this stuff. We love it. We're into yeah. it, right? Now, most normal human beings are not. <laughs> That's very <laughs> true. Yep. 95% of the population has never purchased an investment property. Their own house doesn't count. 95% of the population has never purchased a revenue property. So if you even got one deal under your belt, you're ahead of, this, this ties in with the authority question. That, that's why you don't have, it, have to have a gazillion deals. Most people have never done one. Yep. But we got to realize that most of the people on our contact list are not real estate enthusiasts. They don't really want to learn the intricacies of a real estate deal. They don't want to know the minutia. They want it, maybe the gist of it. Yep. And they want to know that you and I know our stuff and we know the minutia. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's really important. So we keep the presentation high level, keep it pretty short and sweet. And again, is the, the idea is not to get them to sign us a check for hundred grand right away. The idea is to get their interest and, and to, get them to perhaps sign off on an expression of interest or a letter of intent saying, hey, I want first dibs when you've got a deal. And we got to, want to get a number of those people lined up ready to go on the wings. That way we know we've got the capital we need when we need it. So you said high level there. So you don't actually have a deal you're presenting. You're more presenting what you're trying to do, like in more theory? Is well, it, there... depends. it depends on where you're at. So if, you, if you've got experience, which hopefully you do, yeah. I would suggest you show a case study, an example of one of your deals. Okay. Not the best one you've ever done. Because then you have to perform on that best one. Exactly. You got to perform on the home run. <laughs> that's, that's what everybody does. They show the home run and then they set up these unrealistic expectations. Show them a plain Jane deal that makes sense, but it's not a rock star, right? It's, it's your normal kind of deal. It's doable. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we all have that temptation. Ask me how I learned that the hard way. Yeah. You know, I'm a plain Jane deal. And uh, again, big picture, why you focus on that particular market, why you focus on that particular strategy. Pick, you know, if you do a multiple of different kinds of strategies, pick one one strategy and one market. Focus on that for your presentation. Because here's the thing, if you overwhelm people with too much information, a confused mind always says no. So keep it simple. Reader's Digest level, you know, just, just the big broad strokes. Does that make sense, Glenn? Yes, sure does. Yeah. Then the third step is let's kick marketing into gear. Let's, let's get things going with our constant, consistent communication. You're a master of this. I mean, that's a beautiful thing of about having your podcast, that's constant, consistent communication. You're letting people know about it all the time. Same thing with our target group. We wanna stay front of mind with them. So I always suggest do some edutaining type marketing, edutaining. So a little bit of education, hopefully in a somewhat entertaining format and then be consistent about it. So pick one thing, get it up and running. You know, you don't have to be a rock star um, Brad Pitt look alike like you, Glenn. To, to oh, do God. Like you don't have to do that. But do whatever you're comfortable with. If you like doing videos, do videos. If you prefer writing, do a, an e-zine or a blog or whatever it is. Or, you know, just, just get one thing up and going at least one time a month, ideally once a week, but start with one time a month and then build up from there and stay top of mind and make sure that it's, it's light information. Remember, these people don't want, you know, encyclopedias of information dumped on them. They want the gist of things and then make sure you've got a call to action. Tell them exactly what you want them to do. Because people always say, well, Dave, how do you get investors reaching out to you, you know, calling you or emailing or whatever it is? And the answer is, I tell them to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, if you'd like more information about this, give me a call. If you'd like to find out how this can work for you, click on the contact me tab on my website, click on my calendar on my website, book a time, we'll jump on Zoom. I'll show you how it all works. So I'm very, very explicit about exactly what I want them to do. And then guess what? Some of them will, not all of them, but some of them will. And, and if we do that, a good job of that marketing, that constant, consistent communication, then the ones that are ready will reach out to you when they're ready. It's not necessarily when you're ready, it's when they're ready. All right. We always have to keep that in mind. Just because we want the capital now 
doesn't mean they're ready to invest right now. But we do a good job with that marketing. Sooner or later, time and circumstances will change their minds and they will be ready. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. So that's step number three. Step number four is all about the authority piece, yep. creating that credibility you're asking about because you're ready yep. to you know, jump in there. <laughs> Lots of ways to do that. Uh, you don't have to have a gazillion deal, deals under your belt. That's the good news. Remember, 95% of the people on your list have never done a deal. So you got one under your belt. You're ahead of all of them. You got two, three. You're way ahead of them. Yep. So remember, we're not trying to compete with the people that we know of who've got hundreds of properties or thousands of doors or whatever the hell it is that we're comparing ourselves to. We want to become famous, credible, or we want to become authorities or be seen as a real estate professional in the eyes of that small group of a couple of hundred people. That's all we need to focus on. Does that make sense? You know what? That is that that is great advice. That, that's one of the hardest things too. Even no matter how big you get, you always see that guy is doing how many? <laughs> yeah. Exactly, right? Yeah. So we, we don't don't worry about that. And, and we got to remember, not everybody's out to create a portfolio of a gazillion doors. Not everybody, that's not important for everybody. Right. A lot of people would be very happy, whatever, whatever their, their aspirations are. Yep. It doesn't really matter. But if we need to use other people's money, we need to be seen as a real estate authority in the eyes of our investors. So lots of ways to do that, Glenn. Some shortcuts for people. Dress up when you're talking to somebody about investing with you. Even if you're meeting with them on Zoom, I always keep a blazer back here. Put the blazer on if you're a guy, dress business professional, you know, business casual. If you're yep. a lady, you know what that means. I don't, but you, you wouldn't know what that means. Right? But show the other person some respect yeah. and then you'll be getting respect back from them as well. Make sure you can speak uh, intelligently at a simple level about your real estate investing strategy and your market, why it makes sense. Make sure you've got good looking materials. I suggest to, to people have a website focused on your investors. Websites are so easy and exp inexpensive these days. Get a website for that. Don't try to have a one size fits all website. Have good looking materials, good looking business cards. Don't go cheap with the business cards. I mean, you're trying to raise hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. Worst thing you can do. I, I would say don't go cheap on your website either. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know what? You can do a lot for cheap, but don't make it look cheap. <laughs> exactly. So, so again, step it up a, a notch or two. Look professional, sound professional. There's all sorts of more expensive things you can do. You know, get interviewed on podcasts. This is a great way to be seen as an authority or interview authorities on a podcast. It kind of transmits over to you as well. So, um, yep. but not everybody's ready, willing, or able to start a podcast, but try and get on as a guest. Yeah, I'm always looking for people who are doing deals. Like, does yeah. even just uh, even doing their first property, especially in the United States, first property in the United States. I love to tell the story. Like, people yeah. like to hear, they don't want necessarily to hear about the guy who just bought like 400 units because it's and too it's far out of, up. It's out too of context, right? It's, yeah. it's unattainable for most people when they're first getting started. But the guy that's done his first deal, he's got a little house that he bought for $38,000 and wherever the hell he, you know, yeah, wherever. Oklahoma. Wherever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, 38,000 bucks. I live in Toronto. You can't even buy a piece of parking lot. Oh, no, yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. So very, very good. So that's step number four, create that credibility, that authority. Step number five, once you've got an investor or two on board, Glenn, you know this, it's so much easier to get more of them if you get good testimonials and warm referrals from your current investors, because that, that'll start the snowball effect for you. Birds of a feather flock together. People with, with money tend to know other people with money. So if they're, if they're happy with what you're doing with them, if you proactively get testimonials and referrals, that's the fastest way to really grow your your investor base. That that's great. <laughs> I've I've seen you speak like several times now, and every time I can write a couple of notes. I'm like, that's what I need to do. I never do testimonials. I, it's what I'm like. Oh, hey, bud, you're in, you're in the perfect position to do it too. Oh, I know. I I just gotta ask. <laughs> but yeah. I, and, well, a trick for you, and this is specifically for you, Glenn. Yeah. Get somebody like this on Zoom. Right. Talk to them about the deal. A good play, a good time to get a testimonial. There, there are three really good times to get a, uh, an investor testimony. First thing is when you first get up and going with the deal. That's when they're the highest. That's when they're they're really excited about the whole thing. Jump on Zoom, press record, have a conversation about it. A 
Okay. Yep. At the end of the conversation, say, hey, Glenn, there were some really good sound bites there, buddy. Uh, would you mind if I use that as a testimonial? I'll send it by you if you're okay first. Would that be all right? Yeah. yeah. All right. It's that <laughs> easy. It really is. A uh, second really good time to get a testimonial is after you give them their first check. I don't care if that check's for $37, right? It's proof of concept. It's it's they're getting they're making money on their money working with Glenn, right? So that that's a great time. And then obviously the the next uh, a, a, an amazing time is when you cash somebody out of your deal. They're getting all of their initial investment plus their profits back. They're happy campers. Yep. That's a beautiful time, both for testimonials and for referrals. I need to do more of that. I actually did a podcast with one of my partners a couple of weeks ago. Just need to do more of those. <laughs> exactly. No, exactly. But and then you got to selfishly kind of turn the, turn the conversation about how happy they are about <laughs> working with you, obviously. <laughs> but you you know you can do that as as something you do after you've turned the camera off for the actual podcast. Oh yeah. <laughs> Just turn it back on again real quick for that part, right? Or to cut that part out of the out of the podcast episode. Use a pretty testimony. Yeah, awesome. man. That's, that's that's the nuts and bolts of it. Um, Glenn, is it okay if I give your viewers and your listeners a, a selfish free gift? Absolutely not. No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Go, of course, of course, everyone likes free stuff, right? Well, everybody loves free stuff. So <laughs> you may not may not be able to see it behind me. I've got a book called The Money Partner Formula. It goes way more in depth into this whole five step process. We kind of, you know, did the thirty thousand foot perspective here. So people want uh, want to go in a little bit more in depth there and get some tools and, and some real, really good stuff about that. Yeah. Then they can get a free copy. Well, it's not quite free. I trade them, Glenn. Here's what I trade. I'll trade you a cop PDF copy of my book for your name and your email address. That's the trade. Then you come into my world and uh, basically we do, I have a boutique marketing agency and we help people to actually implement all this cool stuff I talked about with done for you marketing services. So that's what that's what my real business is all about. But if you wanna get started with that and find out about the, the whole free book, go to investorattractionbook.com. And I have, I've spared no time or expense putting this together for your viewers. So there you go, there's the URL there, investorattractionbook.com. I will put that in the show notes too, because yeah. literally, I think like one twentieth of the listeners of the show are YouTube people. Like no one listens to me on YouTube. So everyone is going to be listening to audio of this. And so I will put it in the show notes so that they can find a, uh, an easy link to get there. Oh, that's awesome. And there, I, now you tell me that I just went and subscribed to your YouTube channel. <laughs> like the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, that's good stuff. I, <laughs> I actually subscribed to your podcast as well and gave it a five star. Cause you got, you do an awesome job, my friend. And just this, the, the people that you interview and your laid back style, it's it's wonderful. So keep rocking it with what you do, Glenn. Yeah, well, thank you. I, I really do appreciate that. Sometimes it's a lot of work. <laughs> As you know, you're a podcaster too. You're like, sometimes it's, you're just like, oh my goodness, like I got to come up with another one. <laughs> but, but yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. So, okay, so we basically, we went, got through this whole thing. Um, we're basically building lists, um, sorting lists down, uh, doing presentations, going through the whole thing. Um, this is the right way to do it. Um, sorry to, to talk over you right here, but this is the right way to do it. There's a lot of people I see who are going on Facebook and just like, this is my deal. Who wants to partner with me? Who wants to loan me money? And it is not, that is the way you're going to get in trouble. And it's not going to be that you're going to be, oh, you put a listing up and the securities exchange is just scouring Facebook. No, they don't have time for that. It's whenever you, you crawl, you, something doesn't work out perfect in your plan. And then they go investigate you and they find all these posts and your penalty goes way the heck up. <laughs> it's well, just not, not, not only that, Glenn, but if somebody doesn't like you and they report you to the securities commission, that it's not necessarily that they're going to come in there and throw you in jail right away. But here's what's going to happen. Because I know people it's happened too. All right. They're going to scare the living bejesus out of you. You're going to have to lawyer up at four or 500 bucks an hour to defend yourself. And they've got all the time in the world, right? Securities and Exchange Commission has all the time in the world. So you're going to be freaking out. 
you're going to be lawyered up and whether or not you get a fine, whether or not you get a slap on the wrist, it doesn't matter. You're going to be 10 grand in the hole minimum, just trying to save yourself. So save yourself a lot. You don't, and it's just dumb, right? It, it, it's dumb because you're trying to skip the process. People, a lot, I hate to break it to you, a lot of your Facebook friends aren't really friends, right? And the chances of somebody investing with you off a Facebook post, slim to none. And the ones that do are people that you already have that pre-existing relationship with. So yeah. why don't you just promote what you're doing to them in the first place? Does that make sense, Glenn? Keep oh, it, it does. Out of you don't, you don't want to be beating your chest. You don't want to be contravening the securities laws. And so many people, like you pointed out, do that. That's the biggest mistake I see people make. Yeah. Do it the right way. Um, be gentle about it. Teach people. Teaching people. Everyone likes information for free. Teach people. Yeah, educate. Because yeah. again, and but here's the thing, like, like that's a good distinction. Your viewers are here to really learn some nuts and bolts stuff about real estate investing. Our investors are not. They aren't. We, we got to remember that. They want to know the gist of it. They want to know that you know the details about it. Does that make sense? Big, big distinction. So that's a big mistake I see people making is they figure, hey, I'm a real estate enthusiast. I want to make everybody else a real estate enthusiast. No. What we want to do is educate them about how damn great real estate is as an investment vehicle. And we are the smart guys and gals that they should be investing with to take come along for the ride. Yep. Does that make sense? That makes a lot of sense. So that's why I, I like to edutain people. Light on the education, hopefully a little bit more on the entertaining keep them engaged, get them to put up their hand, get them to reach out to us asking for an appointment so we can give them a, a big picture so they, they can make an educated decision as to whether or not it makes sense for them. And then we go from there. I love it. I, I, I've got like four star points that I need to work on myself. And every time I, uh, I go and see you, I write my little notes. And you should know, whenever I went to see you and I drove all the way to Ajax, I think the last time, the... Uh, I skipped going to Tony Robbins to come see you and you and uh, Corey McKinnon speak. <laughs> well, you know what? A lot of people say that, Glenn. They say, you know, <laughs> Dave, toss up between you and Tony. It's always you, Dave. Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Glenn, I appreciate that, buddy. That's that's a big kudos. I really appreciate that. And and yeah. again, uh, I I love what what you're doing with with what you do with the podcast and getting Canadians motivated and inspired to invest down in the States. There are tons of opportunities. I think there are way more affordable opportunities down South than there are up here. But again, for so many of us, it's that that border is a barrier. We think that there's a, there's it's, it's just insurmountable for a Canadian to invest down there. And nothing could be further from the truth as you prove. Yep. And I, I the, what, what, everyone thinks I'm gonna be so pro-American real estate. There are strategies that work just as good or even better in Canada. And there's certain strategies that work phenomenally better in the United States. Um, and it's a lot of it's price point stuff. And there's certain strategies that don't work well at certain price points. And there's certain ones that work really well at certain price points. And I'm not gonna be the guy, I'm the last guy that's gonna say, you know, drop all your Canadian stuff, especially if you're really good at Canadian stuff, why would you stop? Why would you, why would you do that? Um, <laughs> I, oh, that's an awesome point. <laughs> <laughs> I had a, a guy contact me who was uh, a contractor doing his own work on the side of his own properties, but he's also renovating those other properties. And he's like, I'm going to go invest in the States. I'm like, why? <laughs> you got your whole business around this in Canada. Why would you do it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Very well put. Exactly. There's not a one size fits all. Right. Anyway, thanks so much for coming on the show, Dave. I could string you along and uh, pick your brain all night. But I will let you go. Uh, I think we've probably eaten about an hour of your time, even more. <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Love it. Love, love, love chatting with you. And yeah, I, hopefully your, your listeners get some value. Perfect. Thanks so much. Thank you.